Well, no mai hoki mai. Good to see you all back again. Wasn't that morning tea delicious? It was great, wasn't it? No? <laughs> Who thought it was great? Yes, excellent, me too. It's actually probably a bit mean that we're going to go on about that a little bit because um, those who are watching from afar, sorry, it was great. Um, big mihi again to our partners GHD, Asiona and Waka Kotahi, and also to Mott McDonald for their partnership for this next session, Place-Based Approaches to Net Zero. So we're going to hear from Mariana uh, Southwick and Pat Hastings, who will talk through the Place-Based Approaches to Net Zero report developed in uh, partnership with the ISC and Mott McDonald. And then we're going to hear from Carla Bates, who will talk about the Aotearoa New Zealand Biodiversity Strategy Implementation Plan. Uh, now, word to the wise, you'll want to be prepared to get up off your seats for the interactive presentation from Carla. But before we get to our first speaker, just a quick heads up. Um, I hear that some people have been having trouble with uh, asking questions of our speakers, unsure of how to use the app. Basically, you hit the uh, program icon, then hit the session that we're in, and then you'll see that there's a Q&A tab that you can hit to ask your questions. So you can do that with all of our speakers. Feel free to ask questions. We really want to know what's on your minds. Um, so we'll come to our speakers very soon, but let's start today uh, with an address from Minister James Shaw. Tēnā koutou katoa. Thank you for the opportunity to address the Infrastructure Sustainability Council conference. Infrastructure underpins every aspect of our society, providing the services that we depend on to live, to work, learn and play. And it's not just about physical assets, but the services that they provide and what that means for our well-being. Climate change will affect every aspect of the infrastructure system, from construction and maintenance to daily operations to long-term planning. That's why infrastructure is a key feature of the government's climate plans to cut emissions and limit warming, and to prepare for the climate impacts that we cannot avoid. I'll start by talking a bit more about adaptation. In recent months, we have seen firsthand the impact of the climate crisis. Repeated flooding in Gisborne and Tairawhiti, incredible storm damage in Westport and Buller. It's becoming increasingly clear that we must take action to make our infrastructure resilient to the effects of a changing climate. We need to better understand future risks and to start adapting so that existing infrastructure stays reliable and new assets are developed in the right places, at the right scale, and with the right adaptation measures. But the good news is that adapting our infrastructure early can also make our services more reliable provide better value for money and improve accessibility, affordability, equity and social cohesion. And that is what the government is looking to achieve with the first National Adaptation Plan, which will be released in the coming months. But while some impacts are now unavoidable, we can still lessen the climate impacts that we'll experience in the future by taking urgent action to limit our emissions. Aotearoa New Zealand's first emissions reduction plan, which was released last month, contains hundreds of actions and initiatives to reduce emissions and put us on a path to a climate resilient future. And here again, there is a critical role for your sector, because the decisions that we make about land use and resources and infrastructure now will determine our emissions pathway well into the future. For example, resource management reform, urban development policy and infrastructure investment will improve our urban environments and increase housing supply and affordability. An expanded charging infrastructure and improved cycling and walking options will also enable emissions reductions in the transport sector. By promoting new manufacturing and construction processes, identifying and reducing barriers to their adoption, we can accelerate the shift to low emissions buildings. And by developing a national database for building and construction emissions, we can lay the foundations now for even lower emissions in the future. The window of opportunity to clean up our act and to stave off a climate catastrophe is vanishingly small, but it is still there for the taking. 
The transition to a low emissions economy will be a challenge, but it is also the single greatest opportunity that we have had in at least a generation to build an economy that is far more productive, far more sustainable, and far more inclusive than the one that we have today. Norera, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Well, round of applause for the Minister. A good reminder that the climate crisis isn't coming, it's here right now and it's affecting our societies profoundly. Uh, the good news, the Minister said, is that uh, adapting infrastructure doesn't just make social sense, it makes uh, economic sense. So there are opportunities here. The sector is crucial, engagement is crucial, the decisions that are made now will determine our emissions pathway into the future. And although he says, and he's right, the picture is vanishingly small, it's not impossible to stave off the worst effects, which is why you guys are so very important. Um, so we're going to go to our first uh, session in just a moment. Just a reminder, after every single speaker, we do have the opportunity to ask questions. So go to the app and do that. Reminder program icon, hit the session that we're in, and then go to the Q&A tab. So I would like to introduce now Mariana Southwick, Australia uh, Precinct's lead with Mott MacDonald, and she will be speaking alongside Pat Hastings, the Chief Delivery Officer with ISC. A big welcome, please, for Mariana and for Pat. All right, good morning. It is a great pleasure to be here with you this morning as a manahiri or visitor from Sydney, Australia, where I live and work. I would like to acknowledge the First Peoples of my lands, which is the uh, Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And I humbly greet the many mountains, oceans, rivers, and ancestors of Aotearoa, New Zealand, and the blessings that have been bestowed upon us to be present here today in Tamaki, Makaoro. Greetings to us all. And I have been practicing my pronunciation. Um, last year, uh, the Mont McDonald UK team uh, collaborated with the UK Net Zero Infrastructure, in, uh, infrastructure uh, Coalition, Industry Coalition, to produce a report called The Place-Based Approach to Net Zero. Uh, this report was really well received uh, across the UK, right across uh, all of Europe, and was also presented to the World Economic Forum. Um, it explored the UK's 2050 Net Zero ambition through a city systems lens and how the interplay of the national and the local government could contribute to meeting ambitions, how cities would meet targets, and how the cities could help governments achieve their targets. We were then approached by the ISC, thank you very much, to adapt that report to the Australian and New Zealand context. And what was really interesting is that the principles um, and the pillars that underpin that report were highly applicable here, even though the contexts are actually quite different. Um, so we worked jointly with the ISC, uh, and with particular thanks to Patrick and Laura, um, to put together this report, which was um, initially presented in March to the Australian Conference, and it's my great pleasure now to present it here in New Zealand. Um, I joined Mont MacDonald a few months ago and was uh, fortunate to, I think the first draft had been prepared, so I was able to uh, bring my place-based expertise um, to the report, so I was a, a contributor to it. Um, I'll present a quick overview. We're going to run a three-minute video, and then Patrick's going to jump in with um, content and questions. That's how we're going to work. All right. Next one. Are we up and up? Oh, wrong one. So that's the report that I'm presenting. Um, all right. There are some big questions that we are looking to answer today. So the IPCC report released in March this year noted that 50% of our world is already living amongst the impacts of climate change. Both New Zealand and finally Australia have targets of net zero by 2050 and with interim targets as well. And so we have less than 30 years to achieve these targets. You all know that. 
we also have heard compellingly this morning that it's not an easy pathway to do. There are significant challenges. We have technical challenge across sectors and systems and interdependencies. We have governance and accountability challenges. We have political, regulatory and funding challenges. And we have the need for lifestyle and behavioural changes from our communities. We have policies, roadmaps, risk assessments and expanding areas of excellence within our sectors to deal with the transformation. And it certainly is underway. Uh, we are, uh, renewables are starting to rapidly replace fossil fuels. There are new types of infrastructure being created, but we have to do more. If we really want to change this, we need to start considering how we transform um, to a new approach. It is too complex, it is too challenging and too slow if we wait for government to set the targets and for market and industries to take up the challenge. We need to go beyond targets and roadmaps into accelerated delivery and implementation. Okay, so what's the answer? We think the answer is a place-based approach. Now we heard very eloquent, eloquently from Susan this morning around some of the opportunities around engaging with our communities. But in fact, what we need to do is bring together all of the tiers of government to start looking at these solutions. So the three key aspects to place-based approach is that they must relate to the unique context, the opportunities and the vulnerabilities of each place in which they're located. Place-centric infrastructure planning and delivering is where we need to move into. We need to consider the whole of systems approach applied to each unique place and we need to mobilise our local resources, actions and engagements. Now, there are multiple benefits. These still are only a sample of them, and we've started to hear some of them from um, earlier speakers today. But we can harness the local competitive strengths and address the local vulnerabilities. We can break down barriers between sectors, between community groups, between different tiers of government, between ways of doing things. We can enable systemic networked approach to decarbonisation. We can drive uh, markets, supply chain, technology, innovation and change. We can accelerate community buy-in. We need to change how all of us and all of our communities um, live and work. We need to optimise the broader. We can't just have a net zero conversation. And again, we've heard it this morning. I, I actually have been so encouraged to hear the consistency of the themes that have started to become through the conference. But we need to op optimise the broader social environment, cultural and economic outcomes. And when we do that, we also start to attract more capital uh, and insurances and we build the social licence. All of which helps us to accelerate the transformation to net zero. So looking at our cities and regions, our cities consume about 66% of the world's energy. They account for more than 70% of our global CO2 emissions, and our cities are continuing to grow. 86% of New Zealand population lives in the cities or urban areas. But our regional areas also contribute significantly to GDP, and our populations are out there, and there is an increased focus, particularly post-COVID, of looking at uh, regional diversification and jobs growth. So what we're really saying is there is no path to net zero if we fail to consider and if we don't get it right in our cities, in our districts, in our precincts, our neighbourhoods, our regions, our streets and our homes. All of which are composed with multiple systems. There's a raft of them on the, street, on the screen. The water, the, the infrastructure, the transport systems. But these of course are just the physical systems. We also have the social, the cultural and the community systems that need to be considered and the financial, the economic and innovation ecosystems. All of these systems need to be considered holistically to really start to accelerate the decarbonisation journey. So the approach that was developed in the UK and which is still very robust and can be well applied to our context is that there are four key pillars and this is not rocket science. All of these have been touched on this morning. But they are central to how we start to accelerate place-based outcomes. So the powers, yes, we all now have mandates and targets, but we need to cascade these down through all of the tiers of decision-making, 
so that they are best placed to accelerate change, um, whether it's at local level, central level, or a community level. There needs to be a consistent remit, and each district, city, region needs to start to introduce where else we cascade it down to, whether it's the contracts, the development agreements, the procurement methodologies. So many tiers of governments are already committed to place-based approach. Susan said local governments are all over it, but the central governments, and in Australia, the state and the federal governments also need to be committed to the place-based approach. And in fact, in the 2021 Australia Infrastructure Strategy, which came out at the end of last year, the strategy is focused on place-centric investment because they're starting to recognise that the scale of opportunity there is significant. So this needs to be leveraged to make sure that we all have, all tiers of government and our communities, have the power to directly influence decarbonisation. And of course, Brisbane's 2032 Climate Positive Olympics sets a high bar for sustainable legacy. So partnerships is also absolutely central. Partnerships and collaboration, informal and formal, through governments, across regulators, sectors, industry, experts and community groups. The philosopher Bertrand Russell said, the only thing that will redeem mankind is cooperation. The next thing I want to touch on is data, the platforms of data. They are at the heart of multi-system interfaces. They will, data will unlock the insights and innovation that we need across our sectors. They help us visualise performance, enable optimisation and build momentum. But what's important with the data is that it can't just deal with decarbonisation because our public don't really care that much about decarbonisation data. What our communities care about are the co-benefits. So there was an example uh, when they were running some of the trials in the UK, an older woman came up to the team and she said, you know, I was furious when you first took away my car space. I'm like, I have a right to a car space. But some of the data that was associated with that decarbonisation program was around the uh, improvement in the air quality and improved life expectancy. And she came to understand, that's what mattered to her, she came to understand that for her grandchildren, that the outcomes were going to be significantly better. So she came on board with the journey to decarbonise because of the co-benefits brought to her family. Um, and the final thing to touch on is people. So again, we've heard so much about people. This is at the heart of it all. We all need to invest in our people, in our communities, but also in all of the people's working, that we're not just bringing single focus expertise, but we're starting to understand how this entire system and approach can work. So we need to understand a whole lot more. And the glory, of course, is that um, we can harness the expertise of so many people. I am not a sustainability expert, but here I am sharing my place expertise um, and contributing to that outcome. The next thing that is critical is place-based governance. It is essential. The bespoke governance, which brings in all tiers of government, all key stakeholders, to a particular place, can set the right vision, align stakeholders, resolve complex interfaces and roadblocks, enable expert facilitation of solutions. Um, it can open the door to innovative partnerships, delivery models, ensure that there's open and shared data and benefits from the insights, and most importantly, can help curate those broader social and economic outcomes. But of course, it is challenging. I think my record um, across one of the largest economic development districts in New South Wales was that we had to align 12 state government ministers, including an overarching sponsoring minister, two local governments, we had a local health district, multiple research institutes and anchor education in, um, Education Anchor, we had uh, multiple uh, community groups and industry groups. And yet when you started to get them together and align in the direction, it was like the turning of the Titanic, but going in the right direction. Um, I might just finish on saying that the place-based governance does need to be iterative and it will evolve over time and it will continue to uh, engage all the tiers of the communities and partners involved. So there's some key principles. Co-design is at the heart of it. Um, it will lead to conflict and challenge, but I did like Susan's words earlier, we lean into the conflict and that's often where we find the innovation. We need systems approaches, we've touched upon that. We cannot work in siloed infrastructure and sectors. We need to come together. 
Um, and that will, of course, start to drive the outcome because we start to be exposed to different ways of thinking and doing. And that's the way that we start to bring greater value. So I want to move on to some case studies now. I'm going to uh, look at some case studies from New Zealand, from Australia, and also some just sort of up and coming most recent ones over in the UK. But I wanted to start with the, the concept of place. Um, place has underpinned my entire career. From one of my first undergraduate lectures, we were introduced to the idea of genius loci, the spirit of place, which comes from Roman mythology. Um, and this, an understanding that authentic connection to place has underpinned my career. Fortunately, we also have an extraordinary richness of our First Nation cultures that actually have a far greater connection to our places that we can draw upon. And the report does recognise the importance of Indigenous lead leadership for both Australia, Torres Strait and New Zealand to lead our thinking on how infrastructure, cities and places can authentically connect to country and culture. I think they do sustainable connection to country a whole lot better than our Western Roman thinking. All right, so I'm going to touch on, and I'm really only going to touch on these case studies. Now, the City Rail Link project, I'm sure everyone in this room knows a whole lot more about than I do. But the one thing I'd like to draw here is that um, it brought about significant city, community, connection, green and health benefits. But I'd like to acknowledge the partnerships and collaboration. So this is pillar two that was undertaken between all those partners, and in particular with the Mana Whenua, which has enabled distinctive and unique station designs, but just as importantly growing and learning through the gifting of those cultural narratives and design expression. The next one to touch on is the water care carbon reduction. And this one demonstrates the pillar around uh, platforms and the use of data. So it was the first time that a program-wide capital carbon baseline had been developed identified hotspots, it enabled carbon reduction through challenging project requirements, innovative design and efficient construction. And the entire value chain which captured through the Mott McDonald Moata Carbon Portal, which is a digital tool which have, um, basically enables effective calculation of carbon. Um, and I'd like to thank New Zealand and the Maori naming of this because Moata has now become um, the name for the Mott McDonald um, uh, digital tool right across the globe. And the meaning of it is really important because Moata refers to being early and references New Zealand's unique place in the world as the first country to see the sun. So the Mont McDonald Carbon Portal and our innovation um, platform is now our opportunity being shared across the globe to bring daylight to projects and mines for the betterment of our environment and communities. Moving overseas, this was in the original UK report. So the city of Leuven in Belgium. Um, this one demonstrates the powers of Pillar 4 with the people and also the partnerships. So Leuven 2030 is a non-profit partnership organisation set up to curb the city's climate emissions. What's brilliant is it offered a wide range of expertise. It cuts across the traditional silos and barriers. The partners include the governments, the city government, citizen groups, knowledge institutions, companies and, investment and investors. And because of the wide ranging nature of the partnerships, it meant they, it brought in wide community support, meaningful change over 80 areas and slightly unbelievably no increase in city emissions since 2010. Over now to Western Sydney in Australia, um, Parramatta Light Rail um, is just about to be completed and Transport for New South Wales has the importance of place and connecting communities embedded not only in all of their projects but in their structure. What's interesting is that they were committed to driving these place outcomes and they came up with the innovative green, green track which travels through about 1.3 kilometres of about half the track is in one of these important economic uh, development districts. So yes, they did create, or the, 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 the track produced 81% less carbon, but the broader benefits, health and wellbeing, the community connection, the protection of the green space, and in fact, that space is a nationally significant heritage parkland precinct. So it was vitally important that that innovation was incorporated in this space. And it also brought about social equity because it maintained the connections between a growing innovation ecosystem and a new central uh, social enterprise hubs being developed in the area. So the last two examples are quite recent, coming in from the UK. 
So the Strong Suburbs is a new policy piece that has just come in, and this is really demonstrating the power of part people and partnerships and actually has some similarities to your national policy statement, um, which is in development here in New Zealand. So essentially, they're looking to redevelop whole streets. And rather than the developers coming in and buying up the land and the developers imposing the development on the communities, they've empowered the communities to actually come together with collaborative community governance and for them to agree to develop their street. They are located in areas that are close to stations, so it means where they're walkable, they will be leading the densification of their suburbs. They describe it as gentle densification. There are a few structures built into how it's done, and of course, what they've built in is the importance of um, whole of life um, carbon reduction um, throughout those developments. So they're basically dealing with net zero streets, entire streets done at a time, where it's the community and the individual and those owners who are collectively sharing in the value uplift rather than the developers getting it all. And the last one that I want to touch on is some local area energy planning that has been trialled in Newcastle, Manchester and Bridge End. This has been, and, and what I might say is that many of the examples I've shared have one or two of the pillars, but this one appears to be uh, is starting to address and bring to life all four pillars. And as we mature across our place-based approaches, we're increasingly wanting to see all four of those pillars brought in to all of our projects. But this is a collaborative, data-driven, whole-of-systems approach. Um, it's, it's led to some really fantastic outcomes. Um, the decarbonisation options have been highly specific to their locations. Um, they've been able to share the data, the information, and, and grown that resourcing and education amongst all the people, um, and really uh, shared great insights about how to do this and leading to pipelines of innovative projects. And what's interesting was that the, the, by adding in the decarbonisation decarbonisation of heat, it's only 15% more expensive than um, the electrification alone. So that's a really interesting one to have a look at, um, fairly recent. So just finishing up now, um, the call to action. We're all very aware that it's easy to talk and set roadmaps, but we really now need to move into doing. We need to complement and add to the innovation that is increasingly growing across all of our infrastructure sectors and areas, and we can complement and add to that with place-based approaches, which can accelerate decarbonisation and deliver a broad range of quadruple bottom line benefits. As said earlier, competition needs to shift to collaboration, our focus needs to be additive, and we need to go beyond profits and productivity to include purpose and people. So together, we can win the race to net zero. So to reiterate again, we need to cascade our mandates and powers. We need to harness the power of partnerships and collaboration. We need to build new platforms for systemic networked innovation. And we need to invest in people, capabilities, and place. So let us journey together to shape thriving places, thriving communities, and thriving nations. Thanks. Thank you, Mariana. And this is, I've got to admit, one of the most exciting papers I've had the opportunity to be involved in, mainly because I spent so much of my career working in regional Australia. And if I had a dollar for every time, this, the phrase, if they'd just spoken to us, they would have put the road there, or they would have done this, they don't understand where they're, where they're working. If, the, if I had a dollar for every time that statement was made, I wouldn't have needed a salary. And it really does highlight the need to start focusing on what is best for a community, what is best for the place, and recognising that the cookie cutter approach we've used to particularly large infrastructure is not fit for purpose and won't accelerate what we're trying to achieve. What I've really enjoyed about today is really we've started to see the macro, the ducks starting to align at a macro level. And the next step for us is to define how we then put this on steroids and accelerate our journey towards net zero. But more broadly, how do we accelerate our position from an ESG perspective across the country? And it's really interesting when you look at the Australian and New Zealand context, uh, whilst New Zealand from a policy perspective is absolutely leading the charge, what we're actually seeing is exactly the same formation of discussion starting to form up. So the real question out of this paper becomes, what do we do next? How do we as a sector and how do we as an industry drive this forward? 
And the way the Infrastructure Sustainability Council is looking to approach this is through a coalition of the willing. You would have heard in Ainsley's speech earlier that the next, the next big frontier isn't about what, how we compete with the person next to us, but rather how do we compete with the challenges ahead of us. And the coalition, from our perspective, is actually framing a mechanism for us to start tackling those problems collectively to the betterment of all, all companies and all individuals rather than for the betterment of one organisation. We have a coalition forming that is specifically focused on the place-based approach. How do we start to frame the governance mechanism and how do we start to mobilise not just the sector but our communities? How do we also mobilise all of our different levels of government to achieve a common purpose? If you want to know more, I'd ask you to reach out to our General Manager of Advocacy, Laura Harkin-Small, during one of the breaks. But uh, I think this is the next step and the next frontier. And I think the faster we can start to activate our behaviour towards place-based approach and starting to put people at the centre of our considerations and start to think about the systems as a system of systems, we will actually start to drive significant change rapidly. With that in mind, I might just uh, pass to the throat of the questions. Marianne, I'm going to put you on the spot, if that's OK. OK. Fantastic. Um, so the first question posed um, is how to turn public and private aspirations into action. But do you think we, do you think we have engaged with enough, enough groups to understand what that journey looks like, and how do we engage with more groups? Um, I'm going to say place-based an awful lot of times, but um, <laughs> we need to, it depends where you're wanting to influence the change, and then you need to identify who are the key groups, the key bodies for that place who are passionate, committed, and wanting to invest in the change for that area. And it's really important to harness those groups and those agencies because that's when you can get meaningful um, engagement and change. Yep, fantastic, thank you. Um, and I think the follow-up question to that is, is quite pertinent. What's the appropriate size for a place, inverted commas, um, particularly when systems and governance have different boundaries um, to the, necessarily the geographic scale? That's a really interesting question, and it varies enormously. So um, I work a lot at precinct and district scale, um, and there are opportunities in a defined place like that, but equally there's opportunities at a street scale, as was identified in the UK option, but even at a city scale or a regional scale, there are certain infrastructure systems and approaches that are appropriate at that scale. So I guess the understanding of place means understanding the scale that you're working at and the scale of the opportunity or the challenge that you're dealing with. And so for that place and that solution, who do you need to bring in? Fantastic, thank you. And then a, a more specific question around um, the, UK, the UK example. Uh, particularly the strong suburbs example, um, and whether or not you had any insights into what replaced gas uh, given the harsh winters in that particular example. That's probably a level of detail that's beyond me, <laughs> but my understanding is that they're wanting to replace gas and move to electrification, but please don't quote me on that. Have a look at yourselves. Let's throw you under the bus there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and then I guess the other, the, other one, um, the other one that's sort of framing up here is um, how are the streets... So in the UK trials, how are the streets selected and is there a target to tackle de uh, de um of what is usually considered low-income areas? Again, um, it's, it's very new, the policy. We would, we've literally just been reviewing it. Um, I sit on an urban development um, committee in Australia. Um, they've tended to identify areas which are in walking distance to transport so that it gets, obviously allows that densification. And I'm not even 100% sure if they're trialling one or two because the, the catch is they're needing to invite the people to actually embark on the process. So while the policy setting has been established, they're still needing to um, actually gain the, the community buy-in to actually you know, and in itself, again, it's quite challenging. You're needing to get an entire street aligned to the notion of bulldozing their homes and redeveloping a street. So what they're really wanting to do is to actually just try something different. And, and it, it is different. It's a different way of planning. It's a different way of approvals. It's a different way of development. But we just have to try some new and innovative and different challenging ideas. Yeah. Um, but they have set guidelines around which areas and then there's some controls in terms of planning to make sure they don't go too high or overshadowing 
that sort of thing, yeah. Yeah. And I think we have time, time for one more, and I think it's a really pertinent question, because the government's touched on it, might be worth going a little bit deeper on it. And that is, does place-based approach put national targets or the national roadmap um, at risk? I.e., how do we align place-based priorities with the national and global journey that we're trying to go on as well? I don't think it should be putting it at a risk at all. This is, this is about cascading. So I guess when you set up, when the governance for place-based governance is set up for each of the areas, it needs to reflect both its strategic guidelines and parameters and then how it needs to apply them. So it's thinking globally but acting locally. And so that's how we start to align what appears to be difficult or challenging kind of out there goals. It's how you actually translate from that level down to streets and places. So it's actually the connector rather than a threat to the, the bigger strategies. Yeah. Fantastic. I think we're, we're at time. Um, we do have one last question. I'm looking at... Mayama, are we, are we good to go one more? Fantastic. All right, so the last one is, uh, what are the capabilities needed for a successful place-based approach, uh, i.e. people's organisations, et cetera? Nice chunky one to finish That's with. That's a really chunky one. Um, one of the things that I most love about working in place is that you have to harness the expertise of so many. There is, and there is no set, you must have an X, you must have a Y and you must have a Z. Because again, every place is bespoke and different. So it's about actually learning to identify all of the expertise that is required in that particular place, all of the decision makers, which are the government tiers, what are the agencies, what are the locals, what are the subject matter experts? And so then it is curating the expertise needed to achieve the outcomes for that place. Yep. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, if you'd all join me in thanking uh, Mariana for, for today um, and look forward to working with you. Thank you. Oh, that was fantastic. Thank you, Mariana and Pat. Uh, wonderful, too, to hear our cousins from across the ditch acknowledging tangata whenua in te reo, and also Mariana uh, acknowledging the Aboriginal community that she's associated with in Australia. Kei te mihi nui ki uh, Mariana, roa ko Pat, uh, tēnei te mihi nui. Um, <clears throat> great to hear from Mariana. We cannot wait for government. We need to go beyond targets and roadmaps and look to accelerate outcomes. The answer is a place-based approach. She talked about the spirit of place. What is it? We have First Nations whose leadership we can draw on, she said, along with identifying the magic of, of tapping into not just innovation, but the uniqueness of place, the opportunities that this throws up, and how that can and should inform development with net zero at its core, and that by doing this, there are multiple benefits. She spoke to the Four Pillars strategy as a way to get to net zero faster, a multi-pronged and robust plan of four Ps, power, partnership, platform and people, and using this as a call to action. It's time to do climate action differently, Mariana said, to rapidly accelerate uh, decarbonisation. And Pat reminding us um, of the voice that asks, why didn't you ask? Why didn't you consult? Coming back to that notion that we need to understand the uniqueness of place, the bespoke uh, solutions that are needed and where expert advice might lie. Another round of applause, please, ladies and gentlemen, for Mariana and for Pat. <clears throat> so now I would like to introduce Carla. Now, Carla, as I mentioned earlier, has an interactive session, so get ready for this. A round of applause for Carla Bates, Head of Environment with Kiwi Rail. Kia ora koutou katoa, ko Carla Bates aho, he Kirao Head of Environment. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging uh, the, the other speakers um, uh, at this conference and also um, ESC for inviting me to speak here. Um, and also um, a few of my QRL peers that are in the room as well um, for your tautoko and your korero, um, which keeps me going. Uh, in, in this work. Um, so I'm here to talk about the uh, other anthropogenic uh, existential crisis that we have, uh, which is biodiversity. Um, and I'm also going to touch a little bit on the Aotearoa New Zealand Biodiversity Strategy and Implementation Plan. Um, and like Miriama said, and we've got some activity 
uh, an activity to do, which is um, why you'll see some cards on your table as well. So let's hopefully, I can get this clicker to work. Ah, awesome. So um, it would be remiss of me not to start by defining biodiversity. I, th I think it's a word that's thrown around a lot. Um, essentially, it is biological diversity. Um, and it's, it's made of three intertwined features. So ecosystem diversity, species diversity, and genetic diversity. And the more intertwined, the more resilience. And I think that's quite key with the... Um, the theme of this session as well, um, because biodiversity really is a, uh, another tool in our belt, um, which as well as having intrinsic importance to help us with um, managing climate risk and resilience. So what does New Zealand biodiversity look like? And I'm aware we have some of our Australian counterparts in the room as well. So some of you may have seen this, um, but this is a, hopefully this is gonna play, um, this is a video within um, my presentation, which kind of looks like a painting, which is kind of odd. Um, let's see. Aotearoa. We have extraordinary and unique plants and animals found nowhere else on Earth. We have the only alpine parrot in the world, the kia. We also have Homata the snow tussock, Tikumu the mountain daisy, and the grad skink. We have Fio, the white water specialist. They have big webbed feet for negotiating rapids. Hara, our native centipedes are as long as my arms. That's huge! We have the biggest variety of nata on the planet. The poila fanta weighs as much as a tui and lives for 20 years. We have our beautiful native falcon, Kareareya. It can fly at speeds over 100 k's and can catch prey larger than itself. Our giant weta has its ears on its knees and is older than the dinosaurs. Our albatrosses include the largest of all, the toroa. One toroa known as Grandma raised her last chick at 62. And we have Tuatara, Peripatus, Pika Pika Toeboto, the short tailed bat. We have precious Kaka, Kiwi, Kakariki, Hihi, Kauri, and Takihi. We have Whakahau, sea lions. The most species of penguins in the world. Coastal peppercress, eyelash sea, and Tohora. Many of these taonga are in serious trouble. Some are threatened with extinction. We are kaitiaki and guardians of Aotearoa. We must love and protect what we have. Toitu te marae a tāne mahuta, toitu te marae a tangaroa, toitu te tangata. So that was a video that was produced by Department of Conservation um, as part of the release for the biodiversity, the Aotearoa New Zealand Biodiversity Strategy. Um, and I think it's just a good little intro into all the important taonga we have um, as Aotearoa New Zealand, which make up our biodiversity. So there was, I guess, just to put it into context of where we're at right now as a country with, with, um, with protecting our biodiversity, um, there was an overview of the state of Aotearoa's biodiversity um, completed by, uh, by DOC um, and the gov New Zealand government in 2020. Um, the, I think probably for most um, New Zealanders, the statistics are probably nothing new. Um, it's something that we talk about a lot, um, you know, Department of Conservation particularly, um, but yeah, 88% 80, of our freshwater fish species and 100% of our reptiles are found nowhere else in the world. And one in, four, one in 14 indigenous species is assessed as threatened with extinction. Um, and we've still got quite a few species that haven't been assessed, so it, it's likely to be higher than that. So what policy and legislation do we have in, in terms of biodiversity at the moment? So like I said, um, 
the Aotearoa New Zealand biodiversity policy was uh, released, a strategy was released in 2020. Uh, so that's the first document here on the left. Um, and then more recently, Tamana uh, uh in terms of an implementation plan was released and that was released in April this year. Um, and then of course, um, as Vicky alluded to, we've got a huge amount of RMA reform going on um, in, which will eventuate in a Natural and Built Environments Act, uh, which will also cover um, a whole, you know, the elements of um, biodiversity within our legislative framework as well. And on top of that, we also have, um, most, more recently as well, had some national policy statements in Indigenous biodiversity and fresh water that have been released. So there's quite a myriad of different um, instruments out there at the moment. And in terms of what, what does Tamana Otatayo talk about? Um, <clears throat> it's basically the strategy is broken down into five key outcomes. Um, and the first two really are just around that definition, as you'll notice, from, about biodiversity. So the ecosystems, uh, indigenous species and habitats are all thriving. Um, people's lives are enriched through nature. Uh, treaty partners are exercising their role as rangatira and kaitiaki. And also one which I think is probably a lot harder to, um, to sort of realise is that prosperity is intrinsically linked with thriving biodiversity. Um, and over to the left, you can see those priority areas. The bold kind of areas are the, the most, I guess, key areas. Um, pest species uh, are already understood as having a massive impact on uh, food security and our agricultural sector. Um, but also uh, an increasing threat from climate change. Um, tackling biodiversity loss and climate change together. Um, and land use changes and the impacts that they have on biodiversity. And then to the far right, there's a lot of overlaps with um, actually the, the session that was just before around um, place-based approaches, um, integrated approaches, um, to our Maori and, and recognising that viewpoint, that worldview, um, and Mataronga Maori in biodiversity for its cultural and spiritual and ancestral um, connections, um, but also that traditional ecological knowledge which has been built up over time in changing climates, um, and tools and technologies in terms of systems and data. And the implementation plan um, basically will be reviewed every five years. Uh, so currently it has 54 um, goals or sort so of um, tasks which are in there. The majority of them are um, under the ownership of MPI and Department of Conservation, um, but there are a few more community-based um, or uh, conglomerate kind of projects in there along a range of agencies and things. Um, and so I think we can expect to see that over time every five years as that's reviewed. And, um, yeah, I think expect to see a diversification of the people that are owned, uh, who are owning those projects and those tasks. Um, as, as we're talking about through the themes for this place-based approach, there needs to be more local on the ground involvement. Um, and the priority pillar for the implementation plan uh, is about getting the system right as well. Um, and I think, again, that's another key theme that's been talked about through this. Um, whether it's the policy, whether it's data, um, there's lots of different elements or that system and allowing us to draw together as a network and, and have um, outcomes together. So um, what does biodiversity look like for QRL? Um, well, it's, it's something that I've, I guess I've just generally um, seen over my almost five years at QRL. Um, we don't have a lot of data in this space. And so it's really just been through observations, projects, pieces of work where we're starting to lift the lid on what that looks like. So we're going to do the activity now. Um, and so this is really just uh, a little bit of a way to explore what biodiversity looks like for Kiwiro. So there are three tables on this far right-hand side of the room, which each have a piece of paper on their table for, for one of these species. A fish, a plant, or a lizard, a gecko, moko moko. Um, and then each of the following tables has a red or a green card. Red meaning stop, you cannot pass. 
there is something here that will not allow you to migrate. Uh, red meaning, meaning uh, green meaning you can pass on through, so it's pretty simple. So basically, the tables on the far right, what I need you to do right now that have the animals is just nominate one person from each table to be that, be that animal or that plant that's going to migrate across the room. Um, and then basically, you're just going to be leapfrogging between tables. Um, the cards that are on the table are basically going to tell you whether you can stop or go. And we're going to see who manages to get across to the other side of the room, uh, just like a uh, ecological corridor in action, basically. And you've got one minute to go, so you might want to nominate your people pretty quickly. Don't make it too easy for them, you know, turn the cards over so they can't just look and run. Wow, these are some pretty fast migrators. Um, I maybe should have done like a 15 second video or something, but then there could have been health and safety issues with that, I guess. Awesome. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, fish, plants, and other species. Can't get it to go to the next one. Nope, ah, awesome. So, what you've basically just done is um, migrated through the rail corridor. And each of those species um, that we had at the far right-hand side of the room are actual species that we have on our corridor or we've observed moving through our corridor. So we've got the banded cockapoo, um, and we have been doing some work on some of our um, in-stream structures to make sure that this fish can migrate. We also have the McCann's skink, which we found in one of our cuttings uh, down in Otago. Um, and uh, Kabumba Carolina, um, down the bottom, not everything is friend. This one is an invasive aquatic weed, which is actually found in, in Henderson and Auckland. Um, so we've got some requirements around cleaning uh, equipment and things when we work in that area, and it's something that we have to be aware of to not spread. So we don't want to be allowing everything safe passage. Um, and of course, uh, it may sound like a joke, um, possums hitching a ride, uh, but it is actually something that we had happen about four years ago. Um, a locomotive arrived at its destination with a stowaway uh, a possum was sitting on the front of the locomotive cab and they don't know how far it had travelled or we had taken it. Um, and so i just like to mention that, yeah, like we think about things moving around kind of in streams or, you know, through grassland, but uh, they do actually sometimes take the train. Uh, so if anyone from Predator Free 2050 is, is in the crowd, please come speak to me afterwards. Um, so what do are, what are our land holdings and infrastructure look like? I mean, we're pretty vast. We're the second largest land custodian in New Zealand. Um, we have around 1,500 buildings and structures, 4,000 kilometres of rail corridor, uh, 13,500 culverts. And when you think about fish passage requirements now being part of the National Policy Statement for Fresh Water, um, that's quite a big, big undertaking for just one structure, for just one biodiversity element there. Um, so yeah, it's pretty huge. Um, and if you think about the fact that we could potentially be an ecological corridor, um, we actually could potentially have pretty wide ranging ramifications for biodiversity in New Zealand. Um, our environment, it's low disturbance. Um, quite often we're just running trains, there's not heavy access. Um, and so a lot of the land use has changed around our corridor. Um, we've ended, with, with, ended up with fragmented and isolated habitats or species living in those areas sometimes that aren't found anywhere else around those areas. 
Um, and we transect catchments. Uh, we have a lot of coastal um, corridor, uh, which obviously is a really important migra migration route for things like seals and penguins as well. Um, and we've got a whole array of slopes, embankments, ballasted rail beds, almost act like boulder fields for lizards, um, lots of different structures, uh, a lot of riparian areas along waterways. So it's a real myriad of, of habitats. So we're working, we've, we have a biodiversity strategy in Kiwi Rail, um, and we're working on a biodiversity action plan at the moment. Um, we've just kind of finalised the draft and we'll be doing internal consultation on that. Um, and so this is just kind of really kind of high level kind of, I guess, review of that. Um, so we've got some relevant environmental objectives, which we've kind of drawn in and gone, these ones are relevant for biodiversity and, and they actually across a whole range of different areas. Um, but if you look at our deliverables, they're really similar to the previous, um, the previous um, structures which, which were put up um, around people, community, systems and culture. Um, and one of the big focuses for, for us right now is we want to aim to at some point be getting to the place where we can say that we are achieving biodiversity net gain. Um, but we right now don't know exactly what we have across our land. We've got a huge expanse of land and waterways. So primarily through our projects right now, we're trying to spatially map our values and our risks um, so that not only we understand what we have, but we know what we have to manage and we can engage with communities and iwi, hapu, around what they consider as Tonga species, not just from our perspective, from our legislative perspective, but from their local perspectives as well. Kia ora. Thank you. Yeah, he's staying up for Q&A. I don't know. Oh, let's find out. <laughs> Do we have any Q&A? Have we got the... What do you call that thing? iPad? <laughs> got one right here in my hand. <clears throat> oh, yes, I've walked up without it. Um, let's have a quick look. Yes, we do. What I'm going to do is zip down to the other end. All right. OK, so here we go. How do GMOs fit into the future of biodiversity? Oh, wow. Straight in with the scientific questions there. Um, that's a good question. I actually don't really know too much about the stance on GMOs in New Zealand. Um, that's kind of something that harks back to my kind of university days in the UK. Um, I think, I, yeah, I guess, I mean, there's a lot of different people that would need to be involved or in whether that is something that we should be using in New Zealand, because once you start using GMO, it's very hard to go back. So it would be a pretty big decision. Um, I don't know that it's necessarily uh, necessarily something, a stance that, say, Department of Conservation or MPI, and I, get, I guess MPI go through that process of looking at what can be used and come into the country. So I guess they will kind of be part gatekeeper or the EPA for those sorts of things. So I don't know really where this, what the stance is currently at the moment on that one, I'm afraid. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a hairy one, that one, isn't it? Let's yeah. move on to this. Have you looked at how the task force for nature-based disclosures may support and assist the implementation of the biodiversity strategy? And if so, how much? How and how much? Um, no, sorry, I don't, I don't know what that task force is. Who asked that question? Does anybody, anyone want to speak to that? No? OK. Uh, will net ecological gain requirements be mandatory for all Kiwi Rail new design and build contracts? Um, I would love for them to be. I think, uh, I think we are seeing the policy and legislation move more towards that. Um, but I think it's it's going to be on a case-by-case -case basis. So I, I don't think that it's something that we could set at a national level because there's you know, nuances with every project and there may be other things that we need to consider that mean that we can't have that happen. Um, but I think if we are looking at, looking at it holistically from a climate-based um, and a climate risk and resilience perspective, 
I think particularly in some of those kind of coastal um, riparian areas, um, if we're looking at using green infrastructure for erosion sediment control, um, slip, you know, slip protection, slope protection, flooding, uh, you know, as a way to manage that, I think we may end up, and we, and we have a lot of issues um, in those kind of environments, we may end up that we just eventuate with that because of other reasons rather than purely from a biodiversity net gain perspective. Okay. So we can keep an eye on that one. That is Carla Bates, Head of Environment with Kiwi Rail. Big round of applause, please. Kia ora. Um, wasn't the biodiversity video that Carl played awesome? It really reminded me of the depth of life and biodiversity that we have in Aotearoa and what's at stake if we don't protect it. And amazing just how unique our fish populations and wildlife uh, species are. Um, of course, Carla spoke to the Aotearoa New Zealand Biodiversity Strategy Implementation Plan and putting it into action with an energising exercise. Thank you very much. The Corridors for Biodiversity Activity, Carla, absolutely fantastic. Um, the te mano o te tayo strategy, when biodiversity thrives, we all thrive. So we aren't separate from each other. We're intrinsically entwined. People and planet and all the wildlife populations that live upon it. A great reminder. Um, a big mihi to Mott McDonald for these place-based uh, discussions and to Carla, Mariana and Pat and Minister James Shaw, a big thank you. Round of applause, please. <laughs>